Welcome everyone. My name is Alyssa Joneswood. I am the Green Initiatives Coordinator for the City of Hollandale Beach and you are with us today for the last webinar of our Ocean Day webinar series which is focusing on low nutrient landscaping and gardening. Uh, we're joined by Lorna Bravo from UF IFAS and Megan Kelly from Garden of Growth um, moderated by Commissioner Sabrina Havayana who I will introduce in just a moment. Just uh, some background on Ocean Day and the webinar series. Um, it's a coordinated effort between the city of Hollandale Beach, the city of Hollywood, Broward County, uh, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Friends of Our Florida Reefs, and Sierra Club Broward Chapter. Um, it's made possible by some sponsors, um, including Hazen, Pelican Harbor Seabird Station, Pinnacle Ecological, uh, Nova's Helmuth, Helmuth College of Natural Sciences and Oceanography, and National Parks Conservation Association. Um, this is a go-to webinar format, so basically everyone except for those of us who knew we were going to be speaking today, um, you can't really unmute yourself, but uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat, and we will be addressing the questions at the end of the webinar after the two talks. And now, without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Hollandale Beach Commissioner Sabrina Habayana, who is an excellent commissioner for the, for the city, passed uh, and sponsored the Coral Reef Protection Ordinance in our city that includes a fertilizer blackout date so we can reduce the nutrients overflowing into our waterways. So I'll pass the mic and stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Commissioner Javiana. Thank you very much, Alyssa, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited for our presenters. We have some amazing presentations, some really good information for us to all use. And our first presenter is gonna be Miss Lorna Bravo. Lorna is currently serving as the UF IFAS Extension Broward County Director and Urban Horticulture Agent. She's currently leading Broward County's Master Gardener Volunteer Program, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, and the Sustainable Urban Food Production Short Course. In 2019, UF IFAS Extension Broward County Master Garden Master Gardener Volunteer Program received the 2019 Master Gardener Legacy Grant Award. This Legacy Award recognizes the importance of urban agriculture education and educating Broward County teachers in South Florida's community and school urban garden efforts. Lorna is part of the UF IFAS Extension South Florida Hydroponics Initiative team. And in August 2020, the South Florida Hydroponics Initi Initiative video won the national award under the American Society for horticultural science, ASHS, uh, video section. Lorna is very excited to combine her previous architectural experience and accreditations with horticultural ex expertise. She feels honored to deliver sustainable and environmentally friendly programs in Broward County to help make communities greener, and she's currently pursuing her PhD at the University of Florida under the Department of Environmental Horticulture. She'll be researching water con conservation in the built environment. So, she has an amazing resume and a lot of information and knowledge to share with us today. And Lorna, um, if we can uh, make you a presenter so you can share your screen and your presentation with us. Absolutely. Can you hear me? We can hear yep. you. And uh, show my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. And I'll let you know when we have five minutes left of your presentation. Okay. Um, all right. You can see my screen, right? That's it? Yes. So good to go? Okay, all right, fantastic. Let me just move this. Ooh. Okay, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm just gonna dive right in. My uh, presentation um, is going to be focusing on the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program as it relates to low nutrient landscaping, which is today's topic. Um, uh, some of the objectives, and I realize it's a very short time with you today, but uh, my hope is to um, get through um, a, some of the challenges that we have as it relates to our water resources in Florida, also population um, challenges, along with how that's going to impact our water quality and water conservation in Florida, um, and also the impact of landscapes. Uh, I will briefly introduce the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and its nine principles, uh, and how uh, this program can help uh, with our water quality challenges and water conservation efforts. Um, and also I will um, end up with various slides on several presentations uh, and programs that we have that could be uh, available for you guys, uh, such as the Florida Friendly Landscaping Certification. We also have a very robust rain barrel program. We have uh, new initiatives on sustainable urban food system programs. We have been uh, training on green industries, best management training uh, with specific 
specific uh, fertilizing ordinances uh, and various uh, Florida friendly landscaping resources that are free um, and workshops and trainings throughout the year. Um, so I'll start off with, um, I always like to um, ask our audiences um, just to get a feel for um, your understanding in terms of our resources. Um, and as we look at Broward County, uh, you will see here, uh, this is a glimpse uh, of the, um, the county and we have two thirds of Broward County being conservation land, meaning, you know, um, the Everglades, we cannot build there. And one third of that is um, the uh, developed uh, land, urban fabric, uh, and where mostly we, we reside. Um, and um, it, as it relates to our resources, um, I was curious to know if you were aware that for Broward County, along with Miami-Dade and West Palm Beach, our only source of water, that means fresh resource, is the uh, Biscayne Aquifer. Um, and uh, that's in very important to understand um, that is our resource that we have here for Broward County. And as it pertains to landscape, uh, we do know that 50% of Florida's household water usage um, is for landscape irrigation. So that means that the, uh, the most of the freshwater resource that we have here is going towards 50% um, of uh, landscaping um, in, in uh, Florida, in particular South Florida. Okay, so uh, we spent a lot of time at Extension educating about uh, the vulnerability of our freshwater resource here in Broward County. Uh, we uh, have joined forces with uh, USGS um, and South Florida Water Management District to bring relevant training and information um, as it pertains to the concerns that we're having with our freshwater resource. Um, you know, like I said, you know, the aquifer is our sole source of um, freshwater and it is um, uh, having major challenges in terms of saltwater intrusion and loss of drainage and capacity. So we're trying to uh, educate um, about these challenges through trends in water availability for Southeast Florida. Um, and we do have various trainings where we have the Master Gardener programs that are going through this training is already embedded in that. We also work with South Florida Water Management District to also bring awareness about the overall holistics of our water in Florida. The infrastructure that we have is quite an acrobatic act uh, and also bring awareness about flood resiliency and research and study that is happening in Broward County um, as we're experiencing a lot more severe droughts and precipitation rates. So that's a little bit about um, a, the source of water that we have, the challenges that we have. Um, as it pertains to that one third, right, um, South Florida Water Management District indicates that approximately 65,000 um, acres, that would be 25% of that developer Broward County area, are in urban landscapes, okay? So that is, uh, that's a, a big number. And also um, to remind ourselves that, um, you know, Broward County's waterways, which is, um, we're all connected. Um, we have over 1700 miles of canals that are found uh, in Broward County. That means we're all connected to these bodies of water and stormwater and irrigation run runoff contaminants uh, with nutrient leaching uh, pose a significant threat to our wallet water quality. Um, here you can see a graphical representation of what that um, what that means. Uh, we have stormwater and irrigation runoff contaminants uh, with nutrient leaching pose um, the significant threat as you can see it through our lawns, um, our gutter runoff, our street runoff, which eventually makes it into our stormwater runoff and ends up in the local streams, <clears throat> creeks, rivers, and canals, right? So, <clears throat> It's very important to, um, as part of extension and the educational programs that we have, uh, we are trying to educate on proper fertilization and irrigation because we understand that these are critical to reducing the non-point source pollutions, which is the dominant source of pollution in Broward County's waterways. <clears throat> I wanted to also um, express a little bit about the concern that um, that we have regarding our resources and the population growth that we've been experiencing in uh, in Florida. On average, we're getting about 900 to 1,000 people coming to Florida. Uh, this is a representation of Florida's um, mapping. The green areas is the conservation lands, permanently protected. The red areas is the developed land. Uh, this is an estimation of the uh, Florida in 2005, if 
those trends of the population increases, this is what we're going to be probably experiencing by 2016. That means that our population will probably double. Let me go back. Let me go forward. Okay, so think about our waterways, the you know the um, canals, everything that we're connected, our fabric, our um, landscapes, and how that's going to impact. Considering that we already have um, issues with our you know our, our water um, here in South Florida. Um, and uh, to zoom in a little bit more on that, this is the uh, latest data on the University of Florida's Bureau of, of Economics and Business Research that talks about how that population can manifest itself in urban counties uh, by, um, you know, 26 million people by 2030. Broward County is at the top. Um, in terms of the density, the 10 largest populations by county in 2030, um, Miami-Dade being the first one. When we talked about impact of landscaping, we do know that approximately 60% of um, homeowner water use in Florida is for lawns and landscape irrigation. So, um, you know, it, it makes uh, a lot of sense to try to bring more awareness and education uh, about proper landscaping um, efforts, right? Um, so Florida is faced with challenges in protecting both water quality and quantity. Uh, but uh, I am here to tell you that we have this wonderful program. It's the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. It has nine principles. Um, and um, we are excited that through these um, nine principles, we can together work to find um, you know, uh, new ways um, and solutions to try and like, navigate through some of the challenges that we have. So what is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program? It's really an integrated approach to maintaining an attractive, uh, colorful and diverse yard, uh, inviting our Florida wildlife uh, in a, an environmental responsible way. The mission of the program is really to educate Floridians on science-based environmentally friendly landscaping practices. And the goal is really um, to conserve water and protect the water quality that we have, which is so so precious. And I always like to um, say that, you know, our yards is the first lines of, of defense in, in preserving Florida's fragile environment. So you're going to hear that a lot. Um, this is kind of the infrastructure of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. The Florida Friendly Landscaping Program covers uh, multiple um, audiences. Um, it is recognized under the Florida Statute 373.185, and it is defined as quality landscapes that conserve water, protect the environment, um, are adapted to, to local conditions, and are drought tolerant. Uh, we covered um, various audiences from residents, uh, the youth, uh, Florida friendly communities, municipalities, builders and developers, uh, property managers, um, and also we work with the landscape industry through Green Industries Best Management Program. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a really holistic program that covers uh, multiple um, areas. Because um, you know today's presentation is short, I won't have time to go in through a lot of the details of these nine principles, but I do have a presentation on March 2nd that is going to be purely looking at those nine principles in case anyone might be interested. Um, but um, I did wanted to mention that historically, since 1995, the program has recognized 1,162 yards in Florida under uh, those nine principles. Um, here's a, an overall checklist for anyone that might be interested in the program and what it entails. Um, it's really the primary focus of the program is, is on the maintenance of the landscape. That's what makes it so amazing. It's really looking at the long-term maintenance of our yards. Um, and um, we do provide two levels of recognition for those properties that do go through those um, nine principles, which is you can get silver or gold um, recognition. This is a picture of that checklist that you can get off our website. Um, and that recognition is really um, good for two years, at which point after the two years, she will do a check and balance to make sure that those maintenance um, on that landscape has been maintained. Um, landscapes made up of entirely rock, mold, shell, or artificial turf um, are not eligible for recognition. I do. I will cover that more on March 2nd. Um, some of the things that I will kind of tap into really briefly right now as part of my presentation are um, some of the ones that might connect us more to uh, low nutrient landscaping, which is today's um, a, a topic. 
uh, that would be the right plant rice blades, water efficiently, fertilizing appropriately, reducing stormwater runoff and protecting the water uh, front. So when we look at the principle number one, which is the main, uh, the first one, this is kind of like the heart of those nine principles. It's really looking at making sure that we have the right plant at the right place. If this doesn't happen, it almost like everything just goes out of balance. Um, you know, we're trying to suit uh, the, the site needs and with less irrigation and fertilization. And that is done by bringing in the right plant material into your yards. So we try to work with homeowners to uh, make this um, accessible and available. Because of the percentage of residential water attributed to irrigation, uh, principle number two is very important. We try to address water efficiently and we work with homeowners in grouping plants according to their water needs and checking their irrigation systems regularly, among other um, requirements. But if anything, I did want to mention that something as simple as following our mandatory irrigation restrictions in Broward County. And, um, you know, if, if you are not aware in Broward County, we have two day a week watering. Depending on your address, you water Wednesdays, Saturdays, or Thursdays and Sundays. Um, and there is no watering between 10 and 4. So when we do inspections, we check for this to make sure that um, that particular homeowner is addressing and following their irrigation mandates. And uh, we always like to say that plants don't waste water. We do, right? And principle number three is fertilizing appropriately. Uh, this is encouraging um, everyone to follow instructions on labels and measures precisely. Uh, we, uh, we really enforce slow release fertilizers and trying to avoid fertilizing before heavy rains um, and to know your water source. Those are really uh, very important when we're looking at this principle. Um, Another thing that we have as part of our program is any homeowner that is interested in reducing their turf and looking for alternative native uh, ground covers, we do have various videos on plan of the month to educate on alternatives that one can consider uh, for replacing their turf. Uh, principle number eight is really um, trying to address uh, a big issue that we have, which is reducing the stormwater runoff. And stormwater runoff is really any excess water for irrigation, rain, or other sources. Um, we have this infographics here, which can be uh, sent to you guys as part of my presentation. It's really eight habits on how to reduce harmful chemicals in stormwater runoff. Uh, and it's a really um, awesome little thing to have. One of them I did want to mention is uh, the transformation of nitrogen in urban landscapes through pet ways has become something um, that um, everyone is, is looking at. So as simple as reducing pet waste and pick up and disposing trash containers uh, goes very far, especially when we're thinking about all that being discharged and connected into our stormwater runoff. Um, principle number eight also tra targets that if you have a roof and you're not collecting the rainwater, you're also contributing to potentially stormwater runoff and flooding. So we um, we have a really fun program at Extension that is to connect you with um, a rain barrel program. Um, and these are a rain barrel. Um, a, we've been launching this for the last two years. Um, in order to walk away with a rain barrel, you need to go through our uh, workshop and installation trainings that we offer. I do them myself. So if anyone's interested, you can connect after my workshop. Um, but um, you can uh, walk away with one of these and we make them fun with various designs and templates for people to want to adopt one. Uh, the other thing too is if you're using a rain barrel to um, water your edibles and your vegetable garden, we are launching a research project on testing that water to make sure that it's safe. Uh, and if you walk away with a barrel, you can be part of the research and the data gathering. And lastly, the principle number nine, which is protecting um, the water uh, front. No one in Florida lives more than 60 miles from the ocean. Um, so we're all connected. And if you're a homeowner that is right next to a body of water, we'll be reviewing very carefully your landscape to make sure that you keep a 10 foot maintenance free zone from the waterfront to make sure that uh, no discharge or nutrients will make it um, down into the um, uh, body of water, among other things that we'll be uh, looking at. We're working very close with the research center. Um, Dr. Dale Laughing House um, is 
uh, looking very carefully at the green um, alga, you know, such known as cyanobacteria, uh, that has become very evident um, throughout. And he travels throughout the world in Florida, and he resides here in Broward County. And through his uh, workshops, we're educating on reducing fertilizer use to reduce the nitrogen and leaching into the watersheds in order to reduce the alga blooms. So that's a new initiative that we have. Here's a fun case study that I just wanted to share with you to give you an idea on when you apply all these nine principles, some of the um, positive effects that um, it, can, it can have on your residence. This is a, a property, it's a 40 unit 80 residence in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and this is actually one of our master gardeners that took it upon himself to uh, convert their entire landscape uh, as a Florida friendly landscape. They had on the north side, 100% turf, which was being irrigated twice a week. Uh, and it was uh, monthly broad spectrum pest control spraying that was done. As you can imagine, all of that is uh, was going into a body of water. Uh, after the project, they completely uh, removed the turf. They put in landscape beds, brought in all the natives. This is what it looks like after a year of establishment. There is no irrigation and no chemical treatment happening along this um, side of the office and on the east side as well. Uh, there's an annual um, savings of about 67,000 gallons of water and their plant choices have been fantastic. Uh, this project received the gold uh, level certification uh, and you know it's a testament of what can happen uh, even considering that these are existing properties. Um, and lastly, there is this really great initiative programs that we have um, for those that are interested in growing food in urban spaces. Uh, it's called Sustainable Urban Food System Short Course. Uh, and this is done in uh, late summer. And that is to connect um, residents with ways to teach you how to grow uh, food in container, uh, small spaces. We're doing hydroponics, earth boxes, uh, various ways to grow, to uh, also educate on uh, containing any nutrient leaching and also water conservation and also edible landscaping is a big uh, component on this program initiative. So if you're interested, contact us because we'll be launching this this year one more time. Uh, we have free trainings and workshops uh, first Tuesday of every month. Uh, tomorrow we'll be targeting uh, a invasion pathways, aquatic species, uh, invasive plants, um, and which is connecting to our nine principles. And next month, if there's anyone today that might be interested to dive into having your yard certified, you can contact, join us on this presentation, and I'll be walking you through um, a full hour on just how to get started. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, team uh, of Master Gardeners that can help us uh, help you walk along in trying to get all these nine principles um, and uh, in your yard. Uh, so you can contact us. This is just some quick little savings, um, annual savings that we do based on the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program at a state level. Um, and uh, we do have an app. Uh, for uh, fertilizer ordinance that you can have access to, which is convenient reference to the state's many local fertilizer ordinances. Uh, and this is just the training that we do under GIBMP. Uh, we have trained over 1,800 individuals, uh, landscape um, a best management practices on the same principle. Um, so hopefully... Really quickly, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to let you know you still have five minutes left. So no need to rush and um you know we're happy to hear the rest of your presentation okay um so uh uh let me see if i can go back here here thank you i didn't know where i was with my time uh but i just wanted to come back to this because i think this is very important to understand um if you recall the umbrella of the foreign friendly landscaping program we have um the uh one of those is to work with the landscape uh installers um in our industry and they can go through extensions uh green industries best management training that we offer here under the commercial horticultural program that's a uh with uh dr uh, Michael Finidis, and he leads that, um, that, that series. But I wanted to tell you that we've had over 1,800 uh, specialists that have been trained under GIBMP uh, with recommended landscape maintenance and fertilization practices to protect the Florida's water resources through this program. So um, we have a program to educate uh, on the importance of fertilizer ordinances and how to properly um, a, do this the right way through our landscaping efforts. So 
I took you real fast through a quick journey of our water challenges that we have, the population increase uh, that seems to be happening on a daily basis, um, how that might impact our water quality and our water conservation, in particular in South Florida with, with our Biscayne Aquifer and the challenges that we're experiencing through climate change, um, saltwater intrusion, um, the impact of landscaping um, and how that can also alter. Um, but we have this great program that together we can work to try to go through those nine principles and have an impact in every backyard that connects to our bodies of water. Um, it can help our water quality and water conservation, which is the mission of the program. Um, and uh, all the various uh, workshops and trainings that we have for free for you guys to um, contact us um, and have uh, and work together through this journey uh, and the free resources that we have. Um, and I just wanted to leave you off with, you know, our yard is the first line of defense. Uh, when it comes to preserving Florida's fragile environment. We all have a piece of it, right? Um, and um, these are our contacts. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Um, we are at Extension here on Davie. Um, you can email us. Uh, and um, uh, due to COVID, mostly all our programming has gone virtual, uh, but you can just contact us um, through these um, channels. And I want to thank you uh, for this opportunity. And I think I should be right in 20 minutes. <laughs> did great. Thank you. <laughs> OK, you're very welcome. Uh, let me see. Thank you so much, Lorna. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure we're going to have some questions for you at the end. So just stay tight. Okay. Uh, we're going to have our next presenter, Megan Kelly. Megan Kelly is a regenerative garden consultant, permaculture educator, yoga teacher, and creator of the Garden of Growth. While earning a Bachelor of Arts at Loyola University of New Orleans in philosophy, she completed two 200 plus hour yoga teacher trainings with the Yoga College of India and Body Mind Yoga, as well as trainings in additional yoga specializations, including children's yoga and yoga practice on water. Soon after graduating from university, Megan completed a permaculture design certification with Grow Permaculture to deepen her understanding of the whole system's design philosophy. Megan has worked and taught on permaculture sites from the tropical jungles of the big island of Hawaii to the swamps and bays of the Mississippi. She, inc she incorporates whole systems design into every aspect of her life and finds great joy sharing this way of being in the world with her students at all ages and ba backgrounds. Currently, she leads educational nature tours and workshops in Fort Lauderdale Snyder Park with Heal the Planet and is creating tropical food forests throughout the city with local nonprofits as well as in her front yard near the New River in her hometown of Fort Lauderdale. Megan, we're so excited to have you here with us, and I hope we can, I don't know if we have your video fixed now, uh, but I see your present, I see your screen sharing and your presentation. Do we have you? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you to Lorna, that was wonderful. You shared so much useful information. Um, and unfortunately, my screen is not being shared right now. Alyssa was kind enough to pull up a photo of me. Um, for some reason, the, the screen is not being shared at this time, but I'm grateful to be able to reach you all with my voice in this moment. And so I really do feel that everything happens for a reason. It's kind of frustrating, as we know, for these uh, webinars and online meetings when this happens. But for some reason, you're not supposed to see me right now. So. <laughs> My voice is coming through in this moment, and you know we've been spending a lot of time on screens lately, and it is a magnificently beautiful day outside. Um, we had our first really big rain. Lorna mentioned the rain barrel program, and I'm so grateful that my rain barrel, within five minutes with that first rain van coming through, is totally full right now with water. And so um, if you're listening to me, if you're on your phone at lunch right now, or if you're even at home, um, maybe just kind of looking away from the screen and just hearing my voice over these next couple of minutes that we have together. And um, yeah, then we'll answer some questions at the end. So yeah, Sabrina, thank you for introducing me. My name is Megan. I grew up here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I'm so grateful to be with you all here today. I, I feel so lucky to be able to speak on behalf of our community and our land and our place. And 
um, I'm really grateful for all of you all listening in this moment too, for being here in this moment and making those connections between uh, what we put onto our land, how that's connected to our aquifer system, how it feeds back into our waterways. And just right now I'm doing the hand gesture of a circle, which is often what I will, I'll do when I'm speaking about what it is that I do. And making those connections between the living world and our actions is huge. So thank you all for being here. Um, so yeah, I, I grew up here in South Florida like you all, or I'm here in South Florida with you all, and I'm sharing this information because I didn't grow up in some sort of uh, wild place or anything like that. Instead, all of these things that I have learned have been gained through permaculture teachers, both plant and people, but also through um, just interacting with my environment and with my own front yard here in the urban environment as well, too. Um, the the way that i like to grow is through permaculture and if you've never heard this word before that's okay because it's essentially a made-up word for something that humans have been practicing for a very long time but um we've sort of just forgotten these connections so you being here in this moment is affirming that you're starting to make those connections again there's a lot going on in the world of human things, and it can be kind of distracting. But when we come back to our landscape, and as Lorna said, our our front, our land that we live on is our, it's where we hold our power, and it's where we really do have a, a choice. And so um, there's a lot of ways that we can build fertility on site using regenerative methods. So regenerative is that circular hand gesture that I was doing with my hands. A lot of times when we think about the environmental movement, we think about sustainability, but if I were to define sustainability with a hand gesture, it would be kind of a flat line going across. Um, regenerative is this circular motion where we're starting to cycle nutrients back into the system. So essentially what permaculture is, is a regenerative whole systems design philosophy that looks to the patterns of nature for design insight. And so, we can use these principles and this philosophy to create a healthy, strong system in which we're not spending a lot of money. Um, we feel empowered too because we're more connected to our system and using the resources that we have around us. And we can create abundance as well too. My primary thing that I love to grow is food. And so my front yard is a little food forest garden with over 100 edible and medicinal plants growing in it in just about a little over two years now, I've been in this space that I'm in now. So you can use your small space and you can use um, these regenerative principles to not only help heal our environment, heal our ocean and things like that, but also heal ourselves. Um, it's such a gift to be able to walk out your back door and have access to food and medicine and a place to observe the living world as well too, which can be um, kind of far off sometimes in the city it feels sometimes. So I'm sure a lot of you on the call right now who are listening, uh, you've maybe told a friend that you are trying to grow whatever it is on your landscape and you've heard a response of you're trying to grow on our soil? That's crazy. We have sandy soil. We have depleted soil. How can you be doing that? Um, but the truth is, is that we can create real fertility in our environment, but it's not necessarily the way that uh, we have been taught in the past or um, also not necessarily our, our first line of thought when it comes to most things because we're often trained that when we pick up some sort of uh, practice, be it gardening or whatever it is, that we need to go to the store and we need to buy things. Um, but some of the things I want to share with you today are that you don't need to buy anything um, we're going to use some regenerative practices to build fertility on site. So I'll share a couple of those with you guys. And honestly, I wasn't even going to share a slideshow either. I would have just been a talking head right now with you listening to me. But I do have some plants next to me that I just harvested from my garden that I was going to do a little show and tell of these support species. But you'll just have to use your imagination in this moment. And that sometimes is a very rewarding exercise as well, too. So um, how do we create a regenerative system? How do we do this? The first thing we need to focus on is the soil. Uh, I think of my boss, John, at the Urban Farming Institute, who would always say uh, mm -hmm. that we don't feed plants. We instead feed the soil. 
And it's true. So when we start to focus on the soil, we start to realize that um, if we create a strong mycorrhizal network of bacteria and fungi, water and nutrients are more readily stored into the ground. Um, and there's a lot of nutrients around us at all times. Just that rain that fell brought in some nutrients into our system. Um, and in doing so, by creating healthy soils, we create better bioavailability, which helps us to receive those nutrients. Um, because plants are just like us. If we um, have an, an unhealthy gut ecosystem and we're trying to take in all of these nutrients and we're not able to absorb that, it goes straight through. And so that argument that people say about our sandy soils can sometimes be valid because if we are um, constantly, I say growing up here, and even to this day, I, I grew up to the sound of leaf, leaf blowers and weed whackers and all the sounds of the um, land care systems that move through the urban environment. And what's happening when that is taking place is that we are getting rid of our fertility on site. So one of the um, key patterns in permaculture is the mother pattern. And the mother pattern can be embodied through a tree. So maybe you took my advice and you are sitting outside listening to me and you have a tree in front of you, which would be wonderful. But if not, we're using our imagination in this moment and we are picturing a tree Right now, I, I live beneath two beautiful big oak trees and the oaks have been dropping their leaves like crazy. Uh, so many leaves falling down and they're actually just sending out their blooms as well too. But we, we use the oak leaves on my compost pile in the backyard. My aunt and my grandma, they use them too. Um, so whatever it is that you have on site, those are the first things to start looking towards to have a better understanding of how you can build fertility and really lock in those nutrients into your system. So when we blow up those leaves and we send off the leaves to the landfill, we interrupt that cycle of the mother pattern where the leaves go back into the root system, they feed that tree, it goes back up into the tree and keeps that cycle going year after year. So that's kind of our guiding force. How can we close that loop on our site? Um, so we're starting to look towards our local biomass and biomass is essentially just plant matter, things that we have around us. In this photo of me looking at you, I'm looking very serious about bananas, <laughs> but bananas are an excellent source of biomass. Um, and so the way we just offshoot about bananas is that the way we can have healthy bananas is by when we go through our garden and we chop things back, we can create something called a banana circle, which is what I'm standing in front of here in my front yard. And so I'm dropping my plant matter onto the bananas in the center of the bananas to feed those bananas so that I have big, healthy racks. A lot of times you'll be driving through the city and you'll see a banana plant, but why are those bananas so shrimpy? It's because they want to be fed and not necessarily plant food from the store, instead, what you have around you. Some, some ideas of what you might already have around you would be, one of my favorites is mulch, uh, wood chips, local biomass. So a lot of tree, tree trimmers have to pay to drop off these um, trees that they cut off at the landfill, which then creates a big methane mess mix, mixing with our waste and, um, Instead, if we just start, started to notice um, those pathways and started to reconnect those things, we can really create a lot of life. Um, so if you hear a tree trimmer on your street, go on and connect with him and say, hey, when you got a good clean load of hardwood mulch, could you drop that at my house? And laying down mulch is an amazing way to start storing like that rain we had today, our first real rain of 2021. I was writing in my little garden journal. Um, it stores that water in the ground and it, it feeds our plants at the same time too. I have some beautiful tomato plants I'm looking at outside my window right now and I haven't had to water my tomatoes once, which is amazing in the dry season um, because I've been mulching year after year. Um, if you're out west, you might have access to straw. Right now I mentioned I've got those oak leaves falling, so I'm using them to my advantage. Uh, Sabrina mentioned that I work in Snyder Park, and I'm very proud to say that Fort Lauderdale is one of the only cities in Florida that composts its seaweed. So as you see those little beachcombers pushing up the seaweed on the beach, uh, it is brought to this giant seaweed mountain in the back of Snyder Park. And we have a little resource center set up in our Circle of Life experience where you can come and pick up seaweed to add some minerals and nutrients to the soil as well, too.
Um, in some of the community food forests that I work in, we line the paths with, with coconut husks and logs to kind of store that water um, and kind of create these different little edges that keep things a little bit more um, alive and defined. I've already spoken about bananas and banana circles. Um, but another really amazing way to get started too with the nutrients you already have on your site is through composting. If you want to learn more about composting, I've created a, a, a little series on composting through Heal the Planet's website. Um, I, we'll share my contact info at the end so that you guys can reach out to me, but you can also look up Heal the Planet's, I think it's HealThePlanet.com. And uh, there's a whole composting series if you want to learn more about that. But that is an amazing way because we have so much. Look, there I am. It's another slide. Thank you, Alyssa. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can look up um, that composting series because that's a great way to get started. And compost is essentially like a, a probiotic for the soil. So we're adding that good bacteria in. So then what about when we go to the store and we're buying those NPK fertilizers because uh, that's a lot of times what's being sprayed on lawns and on plants to build fertility. So what the what MPK stands for is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And there's actually some amazing plants that can provide that already. A lot of these fertilizers in the store are actually synthetic variations of something that plants can already do. Um, so some of the plants I have next to me right now, which I would show you on Show and Tell, but you got to use your imagination, are... We'll start with some nitrogen fixers. So nitrogen is that N, and that's one of the missing ingredients in most soil. So um, there's these amazing plants that take nitrogen from the air and store it in their root nodes with this symbiotic relationship with this soil bacteria called rhizobium. All this is just fancy words for truly plant magic, that they take these nutrients in, they store it in, and then there's this process called chop and drop, where you can chop the plants back, which slowly releases uh, nitrogen into the system. You chop the plants back and you put it at the base of your fruit trees or whatever it is that you need. Um, and then essentially the most nitrogen is released when that plant actually dies. So there's some great nitrogen fixing plants. You know some of them already. All legumes are nitrogen fixers, so you can cycle through if you're growing annuals, like your beans and peas and things like that. Um, but one of my favorites next to me is pigeon pea. Um, pigeon pea is not in the photo right there. Um, but pigeon pea is great. If you've been to a Caribbean restaurant, you've probably eaten peas and rice. The little peas in there, those are pigeon peas. Um, and I love plants that stack functions, which means they serve many purposes. So pigeon peas, they provide protein in your diet, but they also provide that living plant food. Um, another great nitrogen fixier, fixer is cassia or senna alata, which has these beautiful uh, yellow blooms that are said to smell like popcorn. Another name for it is the popcorn plant. Um, it's the host plant for our sulfur butterfly, nitrogen fixer. Uh, you start to notice nitrogen fixers have this common pattern, too, of this three-leaf um, situation. So, okay, we have five minutes left. Um, another great one is ice cream bean. You can get one of those at the Rare Fruit and Vegetable Council. A uh, delicious fruit, but also a nitrogen fixing plant. Mimosa, you'll see in the understory growing some places. Um, and then tamarind is another really good one, too. There's a native tamarind, but there's also that really delicious sweet tamarind, Tamarindus indica. Um, chop and drop it back, put it on your fruit trees. It's a living plant food. Um, so, in the food forest system, we want to ideally have a balance of nitrogen fixers and productive species. When we start growing, we often think of just um, productive species are fruit trees, but there's a variety of plants that we can intersperse to keep that system regenerative. Um, so those plants I mentioned could be the overstory, but understory on the ground, rather than growing grass and sod, you can grow things like sunshine mimosa and perennial peanut, which are nitrogen fixing ground covers. And then there's some amazing plants that are called dynamic accumulators too, which pull different nutrients up from the soil as well too and store it in their leaves. A beautiful one next to me right now is called Mexican sunflower, Tithonia diversifolia is its Latin name, and that provides a substantial dose of phosphorus um, to your plants, so another really important living plant food to have on site. Um, one last thing I would definitely mention too, and Lorna mentioned this, is to grow the plants that want to grow in your place. 
So right plant, right place, that was her first um, principle, I'm pretty sure. So um, I got some tropical spinaches next to me right now, these perennial vegetables that will produce year round and are really um, hardy when it comes to being in our environment. They take much less care. Uh, they make you feel like an all-star as a grower too because and we need those plants too because a lot of us when you say that you're a grower they're like you'll hear oh I don't, I don't have a green thumb that sort of thing but green thumbs don't really exist it's just learning um, what wants to grow in your place and creating a relationship with the systems in your environment as well too to uh, really create a healthy system um, so I would love to talk to you more about all of those things, but we are getting down to the wire. So I'm just going to tell you, most of all, take away from what I have to share with you all is to return to that mother pattern that I said at the beginning, the tree pattern. So thinking about the nutrients that you already have around you, um, and then how can I catch and store those nutrients? So the permaculture principles, there's 12 permaculture principles. Actually, last week, I'm very excited. I just filmed an online course on the permaculture principles. And uh, the first one is observe and interact, which is what I've been telling you to do this whole time, to just notice what you already have around you. And the second principle is catch and store energy. So how can I catch and store that energy on my site to then, number three, obtain a yield, be it food, medicine, uh, pollinators, whatever it is, um, or even just joy of being in your garden too and, and observing the living world um, just be intuitive in the garden and know that there is no one right way. The tools that I'm sharing with you are just one path to create a healthy system, but just starting to make those connections like you all are doing by being here is really important. I was looking up what, what a nutrient is um, by definition before this call this morning, and it's a substance that provides nourishment essential for the growing and maintenance of life. Um, it's the energy and building blocks that repair our system. And so, as Lorna said, our, our site, our land that we live on is a place where we can really make a difference in the whole system. I know that it feels like there's a lot of other people spraying their lawns and doing a lot of harmful things to the system, but just remember that you can make a difference in your place. Um, and there's a lot of ways that you can do it too. So just have fun with it and enjoy the process and know that we are here to support you along the way too. the UFIFAS system, Heal the Planet if you're here in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and I would love if you join me for all these online offerings that I've been uh, trying to create and share with you all at this time. So, um, and since this has been up on the screen this whole time, you guys now have on, on, the, on my Instagram, if you're an Instagrammer, I, I post some stories, uh, try to daily on what we're talking about right now. Um, and on Facebook, I'll share uh, local events and things like that and stuff like this. So um, thank you guys for your time. Thank you for being here. And I look forward to your questions. And if there's any other way I can be of service to you, don't hesitate. Megan, thank you so much. That was such an intriguing presentation. And we do have a few questions for you. But first, I want to plug a program that the city of Hollandale Beach has um, that's very much related to all the things we've discussed today between Lorna and Megan. Uh, so we have an ocean-friendly landscaping program to incentivize our residents to remove turf grass on their property and reduce pollution through rain gardens or other green infrastructure. Uh, it's a rebate program per square foot, so we would love for folks to take advantage of this. Um, it's, it's brand new, and um, you know this is the perfect opportunity. It's a new year to you know start new on your property and be really cognizant of what we're doing. Uh, and so it can be found at cohb.org slash coral. And we're gonna drop the link for that in the chat. And we do have a few questions. Um, two questions we got from the audience I think would be directed for you, um, Megan. So folks want to know how can someone learn more about permaculture and how to practice it? And also how can they get involved with your programs at Snyder Park? Excellent question. So excited to hear that you're interested in permaculture. Um, I actually created a resource list recently because this has been a question I've been receiving a lot lately of offerings online and teachers that I have learned from. Um, I also really would love to share with you any and all information I can. So that's why I created these programs in Snyder Park. Um, so if you follow Heal the Planet online or follow either of these pages uh, that are listed on here, I post our 
our winter flyers, presently our flyer in Snyder Park. Our next nature tour, which is really fun, is the day before Valentine's Day. It's 2.13. It's every second Saturday of the month. Um, and on the nature tour, we tour the incredible edible garden that we have there, the butterfly garden, our food forest. And that's a really great way to just like take a stroll. And then we've also started some online webinars and workshops as well too. Uh, so our next one is gonna be on regenerative soil building. So we'll dive in more into composting, vermicomposting with worms, all those sorts of fun practices and regenerative soil building. You'll learn more about those support species too. And then we have some hands-on workshops in the park as well too. So if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me at my email you see here, or you can just send me a text, whatever's your easiest way of communication. And I can send you the flyer and also send you that resource list that I created too. But most of all, I would say that the way you can really start connecting with permaculture is through that first principle, observe and interact. So going out onto your landscape, whatever that is, and just starting to notice the rhythms and patterns um, in your place and then starting to invite life back into the system. I'm looking at a little monarch butterfly fluttering around my garden right now and you can create these little refuges in the urban environment and it connects you to, their, to your neighbors and to life as a whole too. So I would definitely recommend that to just start uh, inviting that into your space a little more. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, so Lorna, I think we did have um, a question for you. I had one and we have one from the audience. Uh, so I know one of the things that you mentioned in your presentation is um, that we should do is remove invasive plants from our property and on the waterfront. Um, I wanted to know what are the most common invasive plants in our South Florida Broward County area and found in homes, yards, and our landscape, then which are the ones that most folks don't know are invasive and where are the best resources to find out which plants are and aren't? and where to purchase more native plants. I'll call out one. We have a list. Um, a oyster plants are, um, I think, probably one of the biggest ones that we find. If you don't know what it looks like, it, it's, you know, a tiny, um, it looks like spiky, like the snake um, plant. Uh, and that is uh, one that we see almost everywhere. And it's pretty aggressive um, just to remove it. Um, many people, um, get enchanted by it. We see it in butterfly gardens, but what it will do, it's literally will wipe out your entire landscape. Many times it can actually um, it get on tree, the trunks. Um, so not only would you see it on, you know, your lawn, but literally on the tree components. Um, so we, uh, that's a big one that we see. We do have a list of the invasives. And I would say that every time we do um, go into inspections, 99.9, um, .9, everyone has uh, at least uh, five to um, seven invasives in the yard. Um, so it always comes as a surprise. Uh, but what they would do literally is they're just looking for ways to, you know, um, take over your 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 beautiful uh, natives that you're trying to bring or your edibles uh, and pretty much wipe out everything. Um, so uh, we educate a lot about that. We do have as part of our, our lecture series, a uh, whole lecture on just uh, invasives in South Florida. Um, so I can connect you with those resources. Um, and uh, your next question? The next question we had what, um, is where can more folks find more info on the Rain Barrel program? Where can they get started? Sure. Um, so uh, you can just contact Lorna Bravo because I'm the one that does the presentations. <laughs> uh, but we do have a, a group of master gardeners that uh, would also uh, be doing this. Um, it's a 30 minute presentation. I do them virtually just like now. Uh, uh, pre COVID, you would come to extension and we do have, uh, a, you know, it'll be a one hour and I show you the demonstration on how to put one together. We actually provide them, we actually prepare them for you. It comes with a spigot. Um, it's uh, each barrel is $55, uh, but it already comes all ready to go. Miami Day has also a great program. Um, our rain barrel model is a little bit different, um, and uh, and some of us my slides show you what they look like. But we also have a whole um, art challenge with them, which is who can decorate them. Uh, the most fun way. So we also provide templates to try to uh, bring awareness about wildlife and conservation. We have various themes on uh, native butterflies. That's awesome. And I did have one more question for you. Um, so when we're being more efficient with the water that we use in our landscaping, um, have the folks you work with in their landscapes, their gardens, have they noticed a decrease in their water bill um, and how much they're paying every month? 
So it's a very good question. Um, Broward County has initiated a really great um, a smart irrigation rebate program. Um, I think it was pilot tested last year. Uh, Miami-Dade has had one for quite some time. Um, and uh, we can actually do a calculation on your yard, meaning we, the Florida Floating Landscaping Program, based on square footage. And so we actually have charts built into our program to calculate a potential water savings based on plant species and um, maybe uh, turf uh, replacement. For example, the case study that I presented to you, that's how that was done. Uh, and an uh, enormous amount of almost 3,000 square footage of just turf was completely replaced with natives uh, and drought tolerant plants. So uh, based on our water um, a value and charts in Broward County, we're able to quantify the savings. Uh, but it's not just the water savings, the maintenance, right, that you're doing and also the um, all the treatments uh, that you're doing. Um, don't forget that in Broward County, we get between 55 to 60 inches of rainwater Okay, and I that that's something I do as part of my presentations, not today. Um, so we take advantage of that, and especially if you're into growing or doing a permaculture, it's good to keep that in mind because it's free resources that we have. Absolutely, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I'm going to invite our a green initiatives coordinator in Hollandale Beach, Alyssa Jones Wood, to close us out and make a few announcements. Thank you, Commissioner Javiana. And thank you everyone for attending and very much thank you to our speakers and our moderator today for making this possible. I have a feeling that it was a first time for some people to learn about our agricultural extension office and also a first time for many people to learn about the concepts of permaculture. So I'm glad that we could introduce you to that um, while talking about how we can uh, benefit our marine and estuarine environments by having less nutrients running off into them. So yay. Um, Two announcements before we close. Um, one, the city of Hollandale Beach is doing um, three different dune planting volunteer days. Um, this Saturday, the Saturday after, and the Saturday after. Unfortunately, we're totally booked in terms of volunteers because we're trying to make sure that social distancing is maintained. So it's a smaller event than it has been, but feel free to check the progress at South City Beach Park in Hollandale Beach and see how we're planting these beautiful native plants. And we're actually trying to restore uh, kind of create a model dune system that has all three sections, which we would normally only see the sea oats in most of our urban Broward County dunes. We're putting some maritime hammock even up. So feel free to watch it grow over the next three weekends. Also, on March 6th is the very last part of this Ocean Day series, uh, which is us rehashing something we were trying to do in person before coronavirus rudely interrupted us. Um, and that's a native plant and tree drive through distribution. And that is for Hollandale and Hollywood residents only. Um, but you can register at either uh, floridareef.org forward slash oceanday.html or cohb.org forward slash native plants. We have just a few spaces left and only a couple um, native plants left. So it behooves you to sign up early. Sign up for the time that you would like to pick up your plants and your two plants that you would like to pick up. Um, we have firebush, sea oxide daisy, Simpson stopper, satin leaf, Jamaican caper left. So those are some great options that are um, mildly salt tolerant and good native plants, good with uh, not needing as much water. So feel free to sign up for the native plant distribution. Um, again, it will be on March 6th um, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Hollandale Beach and Hollywood residents only. So um, with that, this is the first time we've ended on time. Um, thank you all for being here. And uh, I'm glad that you all were interested to learn about this. We had about uh, 80 people at the peak of this, all learning about these practices and the things that they can do better for the environment uh, and for their own personal beautiful yard and landscape. So thank you all for being here. And uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email from the GoToWebinar um, email address with some information. And thanks for being here. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. And thank you again to the presenters and Commissioner Aviano for being here for this as well.